in the name and grace and peace of Jesus, our uh, newly born and risen Christ. We gather on this uh, first Sunday of the season of Epiphany uh, to celebrate how it is that God has chosen to come to earth in human form, how God has chosen to reveal God's self to us, and the expectations that go along with that. Uh, friends, I have not ever been uh, as transparent as I'm going to be right now, so if you'll give me a, a bit of flexibility. Um, we record worship on Wednesdays, traditional worship, at 4.30. Uh, we premiere it on Sunday morning, and we try to make it as, feel as much like a Sunday morning worship experience as we can, and we will continue to do that. Today, January 6th, is Epiphany, but it's also a day that uh, I've never seen before in my lifetime. Uh, it's a day that there has been an attack on our republic, on our democracy. Every four years in all of my ministry, I have said after an election how grateful I am for the peaceful transfer of power and to, and to live in a country where that's always the case, whether uh, my particular chosen candidate has won or lost. I have always been grateful uh, for that. Uh, today, my heart is broken because that has, um, that has been put in assault. I don't know yet uh, how it will be resolved because it's 4.30 in the afternoon. Um, there is a, a curfew to occur at 6. By Sunday, we'll know. Uh, but I didn't want to not speak to it. My prayer is, and, and that's how I want to start this service, my prayer is that there has been a peaceful resolution. Uh, that folks who have felt like their voices haven't been heard and it has incited them to violence uh, and destruction, um, I, I hope that their hearts have been changed and turned. Uh, I hope that those of us who have not been involved in, uh, in, in that kind of violence today will offer prayers of affirmation for uh, the security folks, uh, for the Capitol Police, uh, just before I came up for worship, uh, the National Guard had been called. Uh, I pray that uh, God will put God's arms of safety around them as well as around those that they seek to help find their way uh, back to their cars and back to their homes. Uh, I still believe in us. I believe in our ability to uh, disagree without attacking one another. And I believe that grace is a witness of that. Certainly God's grace is. But as a church, I believe that we are a witness of that, of being able to disagree and to still be one family. And so we will continue to be that witness. Um, we will ask God to mend our broken hearts at what we've seen today. And we will ask God to be in the hearts of all of our leaders on every side, nationally and religiously, and in every other sector, that as leaders, we might seek to bring out the best in one another and to love each other into our best selves for the sake of our country and for the sake of the common good. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, I confess to you how much for granted I have taken uh, the peaceful transfer of power in this country and how for granted I have taken um, the freedom I have uh, to preach without fear of being harmed. God, help me to stop taking that for granted and to understand that uh, you ask us to pray for those freedoms, uh, to pray for them to be lived out uh, in every place and every time, and, and to, to have them be accessible to every person, rich or poor, black or white or brown or yellow, male or female, of every age, God. That's the beauty of our country. Uh, I pray just now for the peaceful resolution of what's happening on this uh, Wednesday, January 6th, this Epiphany Day. I pray that by the time we meet for worship, we will remind one another what it is to live in such a, a wonderful place that our, our forefathers and mothers fought for, for us to have the freedoms to, to vote our conscience <laughs> and then to accept uh, what that sometimes we win and sometimes we lose. And whether we win or lose, we are still all called together to be one people. Help us to be that people that God seeks to live into your vision. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. 
Uh, friends, as we worship this morning, <laughs> um, I'm going to invite you to note those, uh, uh, note those announcements that came out in the grace notes this week, uh, one of which was the Center of Grace could um, use, I think it's laundry detergent to put in their hygiene kits so you had, have an opportunity uh, if you're at the grocery store purchur- purchasing other things, if you might pick up a, a bottle of laundry, liquid laundry detergent, uh, they'll be able to help folks be able to do their laundry. Uh, I also would uh, invite you to uh, note the different classes that are beginning to be explained and, and advertised, small groups. Uh, one has already, I think, or has, is beginning to start on Thursday mornings uh, that will follow the daily disciplines. Uh, Sean and uh, Dr. Graham will be offering uh, small groups for, uh, grace groups for uh, Wesley Covenant in the, in the style of Wesley Covenant for growing the faith. Uh, I'll be offering a class uh, for Lent, and so uh, that, believe it or not, is not that far away. So we hope that each of you will find a way to register for a class again again on Zoom uh, for at least a, a, a little bit longer um, and that uh, that will be a part of the growing of your spirit. I also would tell you that we are hosting a blood drive on Sunday the 24th of January from 8.30 to 12.30 and uh, we are still enduring this virus and there's still a need and our blood banks do run low. So if you have an opportunity to come by that day uh, and uh, we will we make a way for you to do that safely, uh, we'll invite you to come and be a part of that uh, blood drive. God has indeed invited us into worship this morning. Uh, We are celebrating the baptism of Jesus, and we will be looking at what baptism means for us as well. Uh, These words come from uh, Jan Richardson and are based on how God calls Jesus, God's beloved son, in his baptism. Beloved, is there any other word that needs saying, any other blessing that can compare with this name, with this knowing? Beloved comes like a mercy to the ear that has never heard it, comes like a river to the body that has never seen such grace. Beloved, comes holy to the heart, aching to be new, comes healing to the soul, wanting to begin again. Beloved, keep saying it, and though it may sound strange at first, watch how it becomes a part of you, how it becomes you, as if you never could have known yourself anything else, as if you could ever have been other than this. God's beloved. Let us worship together. When Jesus came to Jordan to be baptized by God, he did not come for God's people say amen. Uh, Friends, uh, we are going to have a time for our short leggeds this morning, and so I would invite you to gather them around you, and I would tell you all, just so you won't be disappointed ahead of time, uh, Miss Stacy is not feeling well. Uh, She's been uh, diagnosed with a COVID virus, and uh, she is home resting and recuperating, and she misses you very, very much, and we miss Miss Stacy very, very much, but... 
I get to be the one to do time with you today. And so I am so excited about that because today we're talking about Jesus' baptism. And so some of you who've been at Grace before remember my blue bag that whenever I do children's time, I always bring my blue bag and there's something inside of it. And that's true today as well. And so I'm going to reach down and get out of my bag two things that might look familiar or they might not. One is a bowl and it doesn't have anything in it yet. And one is a pitcher. And they look a little bit like what we, the plate and the, and the cups that we serve communion out of. So they're a part of what we call sacraments. Now that's a big word you don't need to remember anything about right now. But they are special things that we only use uh, very rarely when there are special occasions. And so this bowl and this pitcher we only bring out when we're getting ready to baptize someone. Now some of you have been baptized. And you may have been baptized when you were a baby. And so once this children's time is over, or maybe worship is over, you might want to ask your mom and dad if you were baptized, what that was like. Or if you haven't been baptized yet, and they have, you might want to ask what it was like for them when they were baptized. But here in the, in, in, at Grace, when we baptize someone, we bring out this bowl, and we bring out this pitcher, and inside this pitcher, there's water. And I will say to a family, if they will come up front, so one of the special things is that parents or whoever's going to be baptized comes way up front, clear to the top of the chancel area with me, and we talk about what baptism means. And we talk about how it's the time when God claims you. And one of the things I ask if, uh, if your parents are bringing you for baptism or if somebody is being baptized themselves, even though I know your name, and even though I, I know their name, I'll say, what name is given this child? And part of that is because even though I know your name, there's something special and sacred about your parents getting to say your name at your baptism. And, and it, it almost never fails that any parent who brings a child up for baptism, when I say, what name is given this child? They say it really kind of softly and, and very in a very special way. And that's because they love you so much. And they know that what's happening in your baptism is that God is saying to you that God loves you so much and that the congregation who is gathered also loves you so much. So baptism is about you being loved by everybody, most especially by God. And then Pastor Kyle or Pastor Cheryl or I will do a blessing over the water and we ask God to be in the water and we ask the Holy Spirit to bless the water and then we pour the water out into the bowl like that. And then if you're small enough, then I ask to hold you. Or if you're a little bit older, then I ask you to kneel at the rail. If it's an adult, I ask them to kneel at the rail. And then if I'm doing the baptism, I take a little bit of water and I make the sign of the cross on the top of your head. And that means that you are claimed and named by God and Jesus. And you can't ever lose that. That means that God knows you by name and that God and Jesus love you so much that they are going to be with you every single day of your life. And then, if you're, if you're still feeling okay, and you're not crying really bad, then I take you down the aisle of the congregation, of the, of the sanctuary here, and I introduce you to everyone. Now, if you were baptized as a baby, you don't remember this. But everybody smiles at you. Everybody in the congregation just smiles, and some of the grandmas and grandpas kind of cry a little bit because they're so happy. And I say, allow me to introduce you to, and I say your name, and I say the newest baptized member of Grace United Methodist Church. And I take you out into the congregation because they claim you as part of this church family. And it's the best thing ever. And what we say is, we will always be your church. We will always love you. We will always help you. And we love your parents and your grandparents and everybody who loves you, we love. And then I say a prayer and baptism's over. And so the next time you see a baptism 
or if you haven't been baptized yet and you later decide to be baptized, you kind of know what's going on and, and you'll remember that all of it's about how much God loves you and how much your parents love you and how much we all want you to know God and to know how much God loves you. Let's pray together. Dear God, we thank you for our baptisms. We thank you that you have named us and claimed us with our parents and we thank you that through Jesus, we can know what it means to love others as you have first loved us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now I have a special request for all of you. I want you to say a special prayer for Miss Stacy that she feels better and is back with us really, really soon. I'll invite you now to prepare your hearts for prayer. Join me in a moment of silence before we pray. Gracious and holy God, as we leave behind a difficult year and begin this new year, we look forward with hope, remembering you and your promise to always be with us. God, there's much chaos and disorder for us right now, for now, but not forever, because you, God, bring order out of chaos. Your spirit is active in our lives and in our world, working for your good purposes. We come to you in worship in all the different ways that are possible for us right now. And even when we can't be together in person, we recognize our needs. We come to you as a people in need of healing and wholeness. We come to you as a people in need of assurance and forgiveness. And we come dependent upon your love. So draw us close and fill us with your spirit as we care for each other and for your world through our thoughts and our prayers. God, we lift up for your care each prayer request for healing and comfort submitted from within our own worshiping community. May each person in need feel the warmth of your love and the assurance of your presence healing and comforting them. We lift up for your care during these cold winter months the homeless people who do not have adequate shelter and heating. We pray to you about the recent surge in COVID cases in our country. We pray that every person is able to receive the health care needed. May the hospitals be able to handle every case. We thank you for the ongoing courage and dedication of our nation's health care workers and ask you to strengthen them physically, emotionally, and spiritually. We pray for the successful and timely distribution and administration of the COVID vaccines and that these measures will quickly relieve suffering and start the healing process for the entire world. Merciful God, we confess that lockdowns and illness, suffering, death, separation, and lack of contact are wearing us down mentally, physically, and spiritually. Keep us far from despair and continue to give us hope. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
those of you who receive grace notes, uh, you saw in there this week a thank you. Uh, we are thankful for how this congregation has responded in ways that uh, to me are miraculous uh, financially throughout probably the hardest year of all of our lives. Uh, you enabled us to continue to do the ministry that God calls us to. And in, in the uh, pledge drive that we have, you have given us foundation to continue that ministry into 2021. And so we want to thank you with humble hearts for your generosity. And we invite any of you who are worshiping with us, uh, know that uh, we covet with great responsibility the gifts that you might feel uh, generous to send and know that the ministry that we do is done for the heart of God and God's people. We invite you now to worship with us as in, through the giving of our tithes and offerings.
us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come before you uh, humbly with these gifts. Uh, Only you know how it is that uh, you are able to move in us to be generous. And through the power of your spirit, you give us this generosity that it might reach out into your world in ways that we may know and in many ways that we won't know. God, we trust you with these gifts and ask that you would bless them and bless the hands that will receive them, that all of us might know that indeed we are a part of your family that stretches all around the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I invite you now to prepare your hearts and minds for the reading from these scriptures. Our first lesson this morning comes from the book of Acts. Here in chapter 19, as Paul continues his ministry, he encounters some believers who are unfamiliar with the baptism of Jesus. Beginning in verse 1. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the interior regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They replied, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said, Into what then were you baptized? They answered, Into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there were about 12 of them. May God add God's blessing to the hearing and the reading of these words. If you would please stand for the gospel reading. Reading from the gospel of Mark chapter 1. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Arise and shine the light Lift up your 
and shine your light has come the glorious day of the Lord Arise, arise for your light has come Arise with the morning sun shine the light has come the glorious day of the lord arise and shine the light has come the glorious day glorious day was the last time you said I can't wait till uh, do you wait till after Thanksgiving to to say that about Christmas oh I can't wait till Christmas or maybe Christmas break or or maybe you started saying that after Halloween or or before Halloween oh I can't wait till they start paying, playing Christmas music on the radio maybe maybe the last time you said it it was about your birthday oh I can't wait till my birthday I I can't wait till I'm 16 I can't wait till I'm 21. I can't wait till I'm 59. And there's always something out there we desire. Right? Something, something that's going to happen at that time that we can't wait for. To open our Christmas presents. To, to get a, a break from the work that we do every day. To, to be able to, to drive legally. To be able to have root beer without the root. To, to be able to be considered wise and aged there's always something out there that we can't wait for how many times have we said that through 2020 I can't wait till 2020 is over I can't wait till 2021 I can't wait till the vaccine I can't wait till life goes back to normal I I can't wait to hug my family and friends again I, I can't wait to worship in person and and actually see the people that I that I sit by and that I am so used to talking to every week I just can't wait well guess what for those of us who just can't wait Mark is our gospel Mark is an I can't wait gospel when you when you open to the first chapter the first verse of Mark it says the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, wait, where's Mary and Joseph? Oh, they aren't in Mark's gospel. Where are the shepherds on the hill? They're not in Mark's gospel. Where are the angels? They're not in Mark's gospel. Mark can't wait for Jesus to get started. So Mark's gospel starts with John the Baptist appearing in the wilderness as Isaiah had prophesied. And as John uh, appears in the wilderness and is baptizing everybody who wants to come and Mark's gospel said there's a whole lot of people that wanted to come and repent and, and, and be washed clean of their sins, th then Jesus comes and, and asks to be baptized by John. And it says that John baptizes Jesus. There, there is no sort of interaction between John and, and Jesus like there are in the, in the other Gospels where, where John says, no, no, you should be baptizing me. I mean, John has said to the people he's baptized previously, hey, listen, one who is, there's one who is coming whose, whose, whose sandals thong I'm not even worthy of untying. But he doesn't have that interaction with Jesus, not, not in Mark's Gospel. It says, Jesus comes from Nazareth to be baptized and as he's coming out of the water the heavens are torn open and a voice from heaven comes saying this is my son the beloved in whom I am well pleased. And, and that's how the gospel starts. There, there are no magi following a star for two years. You see what takes Matthew a, a chapter and a half to get to and Luke a full two chapters to get to. Mark it takes 15 verses. I can't wait. I can't, I can't wait for what happens at Jesus' baptism. I, I can't wait for what it is that God has to say for us, I, say to us. I, I can't wait. Matthew, Matthew has this genealogy that will trace Joseph, Jesus' earthly father, all the way back to, to Abraham through King David. Because that gives Jesus sort of immediate royal credibility. 
Luke has Jesus' genealogy through Joseph all the way back to Adam in the garden to give him that kind of godly credibility. Even the Gospel of John says that, that Jesus was in the beginning with God, that all things came into being through him and that not one thing came into being without him, which, chase, which, which takes Jesus all the way back to, to the very beginning of even being in God. But Mark says, this is the beginning of the good news. John appeared baptizing, repentance and forgiveness of sins. Jesus came to be baptized. He came out of the water. The heavens were torn open. The voice came saying, this is my son, the beloved, in whom I'm well pleased. And Jesus is immediately driven into the desert to be tempted by, by Satan. Mark can't wait. What can't Mark wait for? The word torn open. The Greek word for Mark's version of what happens at Jesus' baptism. Uh, again, in, in Matthew's uh, version of Jesus' baptism, it says, that at the, it says that the heavens were opened for him. And, it, and in, Luke's, in Luke's gospel, it says that the heavens opened. And in John's gospel, it says John the Baptist witnessed the heavens being opened for him. In Mark's gospel, it says the heavens were torn open. And the voice of God came. The Greek word is stizo. You know where else that word is used? At the end of Mark's gospel. In the 15th chapter, the 38th verse. In the 37th verse, it says, Then Jesus breathed his last from the cross. And the 38th verse says, And the curtain in the temple was torn apart in two. See, Mark can't even wait for the crucifixion to connect Jesus' beginning of ministry and the end of his ministry with a singular understanding. With this torn apart nature of how God is perhaps anxious to come to earth in human form so that nothing will separate us from the love of God. That's how Paul puts it in, in his letter to the Romans. So that nothing in life or in death will ever separate us from the love of God. And Mark seems to have that urgency. Mark seems to have, I can't wait till you can see that God wants nothing between us. God doesn't want the veil of heaven between us, so God's going to tear that open and come down in Jesus' baptism. And it never says, then God sews it back up and goes back up into heaven. And Mark wants us to know that at Jesus' death, even at the end of his earthly life, that that curtain that's in the temple that keeps regular people from God without going through the pastor first, that that curtain is torn in two because God can't wait to be in relationship with us that directly. Is that what baptism means to us? That, that radical act of God's power and, and God's presence that promises to be with us in every minute of every day of our lives. When we say, oh, I can't wait till. Is that how we feel about baptism? <laughs> I can't wait till my baby is born so I can have he or she baptized. I, I can't wait to get into that church as an adult because I've never been baptized. Do we understand baptism with that with that kind of intensity, that kind of commitment, that, that kind of understanding of God. Uh, Paul is interested in the same thing from the, uh, from, the, from the Acts of the Apostles reading this morning that Pastor Cheryl read. Uh, Paul is traveling as he does in the Acts of the Apostles and he comes across some disciples, the, the scripture says, and he says, um, have, has the Holy Spirit come upon you? And and these disciples say, we don't, we don't know anything about the Holy Spirit. And Paul says, then, then into what were you baptized? Keep a hold of that question. Paul says, into what were you baptized? And they say, we experienced John's baptism. And John's a big deal. John's the son of Elizabeth and Zechariah. John is set aside for a purpose in life, and that's to prepare the way for Jesus Christ. So John was a big deal. 
They were baptized by John into John's baptism and that's what they know. And Paul says, no. No, you need to know the Holy Spirit and the way you know the Holy Spirit is to be baptized into Jesus Christ. You see, what was happening in the, in the days when Paul was helping to start these churches is that who, whatever evangelist came by and did baptisms, that's who people thought they were baptized into. So it was like, I have, I have Apollos' baptism. I have Paul's baptism. I have John's baptism. I have Pastor Cheryl's baptism. I have Pastor Kyle's baptism. I have Pastor Nanette's baptism. And Paul says, no, 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 no. You aren't going to know the power and presence of God without understanding that you're baptized into Christ. That's the one and only baptism. And so the scripture in Acts says that Paul baptizes them in Christ and they receive the Holy Spirit and then we get really nervous as mainline Protestants because they begin speaking in tongues and prophesying. And so we shut our minds off because we think if if that's the way the Holy Spirit comes and that's not really a part of who I am. It doesn't say that's the only way the Holy Spirit comes. We... Friends, we, when we are baptized, with the words that we say in blessing over the water, we invite the Holy Spirit to come and bless the water and the one who receives it, that they may know themselves to be a child of God's grace from that day forward for the rest of their lives. The Holy Spirit, we believe, comes in that moment at that time. And what Paul is asking these disciples is, how is the Holy Spirit present with you? Well, friends, that's not a bad question. How's the Holy Spirit showing itself up in, in, in us? We who maybe were baptized 58 years ago or 47 years ago, 15 years ago. You see, baptism isn't a one-off event. It's being named and claimed by God as a beloved child. And and God is so anxious for that, that God tears the heavens open to say, you are my beloved child. And Paul says in that moment, the dove descends, that's that's the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now, what is it that we're doing through the power of the Holy Spirit for God's world if we so believe that we are baptized into Christ? And do we, do we believe, does our life show we're baptized into Christ? Is that the priority of our life? Living like Jesus? See, that gives me pause. Am I living with a priority that my baptism, my commitment in my life is to my faith in Jesus Christ? See, I wasn't baptized into my nuclear family. I wasn't baptized only to that local church. I wasn't baptized into a particular nation. I was baptized into Christ who supersedes all of those other relationships. And so I have to ask myself the question, as one having been baptized into Christ and receiving the Holy Spirit, empowering me to live like Jesus, how am I doing? What am I doing for Jesus that witnesses in my life that that baptism took, that it has a hold on me, whether it was a year ago or 58? How is it that the Holy Spirit shows up? I don't, I don't speak in tongues. I don't have that gift. I don't know that I have the gift of prophecy. <laughs> but I have a few gifts that I know I can use for God's sake in God's world. I can work as an advocate for those whose voices aren't often heard. Who may be oppressed by poverty or may be oppressed by prejudicial bias or maybe even are are oppressed by their material goods and wealth. Am I doing that? 
Am I allowing the spirit of Christ to which I was baptized into to help me decide each day how I am speaking, how I am acting, and where I'm choosing to go and how I'm choosing to use my time? Is it Jesus that is the that is the lens through which I look to what I'm going to do for the day. And do I know about Jesus enough to know what that means? Baptism asks us that question. We answer those questions for our infants, for our children. Confirmation students answer those questions for themselves. Do you commit yourself to to ministry in a church that God has opened to people of all nations, ages, and races. Does that still echo in us as disciples of this Jesus? We love baptisms. I don't doubt that a bit. I love them. This congregation loves them. I can't wait till we can do baptisms again in person. And to look at those children that are being baptized and to welcome them into our congregation. But then that afternoon, do we we ask ourselves, is that commitment still true for me? I I have to tell you, there was a a sermon I read this week by a pastor named Max Grant, who's the pastor of Second Congregational Church in Greenwich, Connecticut. I'm not sure that's how you pronounce it. But he suggested, and I love this idea, he suggested that baptism, maybe baptism should be the decision to skydive, right? That, that theologically for him, it makes some sense that, that you have to take a leap of faith, that maybe the falling is sort of reminding us of, uh, of how we fall into sin, and that what we see out before us is the vista of salvation, And that when we pull the ripcord, something other than ourselves saves us. And then we have this gently, I mean, I've never skydived, so I'm assuming it's gently. We have this gently floating down feeling. Maybe a feeling of being safe in God's arms while we're allowed to see the great beauty of all God's creation. He says, think about it. If it was that intense of a decision that you had to decide if you were going to jump out of a plane in order to be a part of Christ's family and a member of a church. He said, then how might we look at each other differently when we come to worship on Sunday? You know, those people that get on our nerves because they talk too much or or, or those people who, uh, who, who... are more worried about sort of how the building looks than what, what the worship service is like or those people who decide that they don't like worship because the, the music is wrong that day or the wrong preacher is preaching or uh, how might we look at, at, at each other differently with those kind of nagging things that bother us if we think to ourselves, but wait, at some point in their lives, they had to decide to jump out of a plane too, just like I did. Would we be less annoying with one another? Would, would, would we stop worrying about the minute details of how it is that we appear to one another? Because we would know we all made that sort of life, literally life-risking decision. And might that unite us? I know it sounds silly, but, but there's, a, there's an intensity to that kind of decision. That, that we really don't connect with baptism and having our children baptized. Maybe we need to rethink that. If, if Mark's gospel is going to connect God tearing open the heavens in order that we might know that God wants to be with us and God wants us to know that we are all beloved children and, and, and if Mark wants us to understand that the curtain in the temple is torn apart at Jesus' death so that nothing can keep us separated from the love of God, even death itself, then maybe, maybe baptism is meant to be that radical, that big a commitment, 
that much of a risk and that much of a unifier where we look at each other as family. I can't wait till we can worship in person again. I can't wait till we witness how it is that God's kingdom continues to come into this world and this time. Amen. amazing grace that allows us to live in community together, to love with the heart of God through the power of God reaching out to us and tearing open the heavens that we might know that we are loved. Share that love with one another as we share the blessing of being a community of faith as we sing our closing hymn together. Wash, O oh God, our sons and daughters, where you cleanse waters flow number them among your people 
Bless as Christ blessed long ago. Weave them garments bright and sparkling. Compass them with love and light. Fill, anoint them, send your spirit. Holy dove and a heart's delight. Oh, how deep your holy wisdom. Unimagine all your ways to your name. of the first chapter of Mark's gospel. It has Jesus coming out of the wilderness having contended with the Satan or the adversary. And Jesus says this, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the gospel. Friends, the kingdom of God is near to us. The power of God's spirit lives in us. And the grace of Jesus Christ is that which leads us forward. Let's go in grace and go in peace. Amen.